I've got it. I'm going to read it, but I want to make sure it's a good follow. Yes. Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and start our meeting. We were just wrapping up a couple little technical details, so the agenda is up. Um, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order and begin with a roll call. Sure. I know we have um, quite a few people absent. If you were here as a proxy for someone, um, just let me know if I can make a note of it. So, Alex, here. Van Virgin. Bella. Boyd. Here. Brandenburg. Here. Paramanica. Karma. Chang. Here. Council. Here. Cuomo. Ellen Purple. Doms. Here. Davis. Here. Neff. Here. Dyer. Here. Edel. Here. Elias here. Evans here. Green here. Griffin here. Adam here. Hampton Hester here. Jansen Eric Pesmino Han here. Kozak uh, Gavin Lee here. Sung Lee. Here. Maggiano. Here. Mason. Here. Matthews. Um, what is your name? You can remind me. Uh, right. McLean. Here. Moon. Morales. Here. Olivieri Parker. Here. Perry. Phillips, Riker, Robert, Rollins, here, Song, here, that's cool, <laughs> Shepard, Shen, here, Swift, here, Sykes, here, Talbot, Waters, yeah. Weber. Here is Proxy. Way. Yeah. Wentz. Wofford. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me also thank our visitors. We've got some administrators who are here with us today, some faculty who are not senators, but are here to represent some issues and questions they have. And of course, our students, we, we thank you for voicing your concerns and coming here in a, a respectful manner to do that. So we're gonna have opportunity to address some of those concerns a little bit uh, later today, but um, I want to thank everyone for coming. We love having a well-attended Senate, so you've boosted our numbers. Um, 
And I know there's more to it than that, but I, I appreciate your presence. Uh, we're going to go ahead with the administrator uh, reports. Uh, let me say this. We'll start with the president, but if you received the uh, email about the response of the provost to some questions I raised, we're going to address those, but I want to do that in the provost report time. He can't be here today, but I'm going to read his response, and then we'll go ahead and, and uh, take questions. We've got our graduate school dean here and our college dean here, so we have people here who can help with that process. But I want to give the president the time for his report first, and then we'll move to that topic within the provost report, if that's okay with you. No, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I'll, I'll just say as an extension to that, uh, the issue that you're raising right now is one that lives with deans and with provosts right now. It's not actually an issue on my desk. Otherwise, we don't need deans and a provost. Uh, and we're going to let them uh, play that out and do their job. So let me give you uh, a few quick updates. Uh, one, let's start with the legislative session because that is uh, unfurling quickly. Uh, fiscal year 24 budget has been closed. Uh, so that is uh, finished and through the process. And bear in mind that they do an amended budget every single year. They take the current fiscal year, and if there are decreases in funding, we didn't collect as many state taxes over the course of the year of revenues as they anticipated, but they already put budgets out. We can get a mid-year cut. We've been through that before. Uh, if there are uh, surplus revenues, we might get extra money. This is the surplus year, uh, so we did. I'll walk you through that. Uh, one, there was a restoration of the 66 million that was taken out of the USG at the very end of the legislative session last year. We had a $1.6 million cut. Uh, well, we had a little better than $1.6 million cut. The restoration came back uh, a little less than that. Uh, even though the whole $66 million came back, uh, the Board of Regents decides what that distribution is. And sometimes, uh, even when you have revenue or enrollment growth, we don't get our full formula funding. So if we get enrollment growth and we're supposed to get $100 because of that enrollment growth, we will often get 80. Uh, just like when we have an enrollment decline, if we're supposed to lose $100, we will uh, not have to take that full cut. And, and, and that's a way of just kind of equitably distributing resources across the USG. If they didn't do it that way, uh, Georgia Tech would have revenues uh, outside, you know, out of the wazoo along with Georgia, and you have a lot of other institutions that are struggling. So the USG is built that way. Uh, nonetheless, that restoration came back and uh, and we're grateful for that. Uh, additionally, in fiscal year 24, demolition money came in for uh, the Dallas State and for the University of West Georgia that's dedicated to anthropology uh, coming down. I'll remind everybody that anthropology is the smallest academic building. It uses more energy than any other building uh, inside of our academic portfolio, including humanities. I'm grateful to get that down uh, as a result. Uh, that will open up some new opportunities for us on campus uh, because that really connects the, the middle of campus to front campus, which uh, has had a disconnect because of those buildings for a long time. Uh, that project hasn't been put in place yet. We have to receive the funding first for the state and actually authorize it. Anytime you have a demolition, we ask the governor if we can take down the building. Uh, the governor has to sign off on it. Sometimes that sign off takes years before he actually uh, takes action, even if the money is in place. In this particular case, I expect that that building will come down sometime either uh, by September, October, uh, but certainly by mid uh, fall. At least that's the report we're getting now. I'll also remind you that we are coming up to being within weeks of the project for the demolition of Tyus to begin. Uh, so do know that, that there is movement there. And finally, there was, I believe, just about $80 million in new MRR funding. That's maintenance, uh, repair, renovation. I believe that's the two R's. Uh, that's for the USG. We will get an allotment of that. That's really for replacement of boilers and chillers and things that are at end of life that, that run buildings. And it has to be used that way. Fiscal year 25, I have... Three updates for you. One, uh, I think probably top of everybody's mind is the 4% salary increase for state employees. Now that's made it through the House. It is currently in the Senate. 
We do not know the state of that right now. Uh, the Senate and the House are a little bit different this year, and and, um, and we, we can't anticipate all of the Senate's moves. So I'll keep you updated on that front. That's a 4% increase with a $3,000 ceiling. Uh, the governor didn't put it in his budget. So the governor put it in his budget is the key factor, but we have uh, two chambers uh, that the governor signs off on and that budget hasn't come out and uh, and we'll 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 see how that goes. Uh, second is the restoration of the 66 million fiscal year 25. So while our cut was 1.6 million last year, we got a good portion of that back, but uh, not all of it. Uh, we still have to go through the process of getting that 66 million restored in the fiscal year 25 budget. Uh, again, that's sitting in the Senate. Uh, I'll keep you updated as we go. And, and finally, it's the Pafford funding. We, the governor has signed off on, on a third of the funding for the renovation of Pafford. The House has signed off on a third of that funding, and we rely on the Senate. That's where we're going to say, Georgia, everybody throws in a third, uh, but it's with the Senate. And we're going we're gonna to find out how that turns out. So I will leave it right there. If there are any other questions on a legislative session about any point, Sarah Powell's with me, uh, serves as our chief of staff and really oversees all of our government relations. Uh, she can answer those questions or we will get you the answer if we don't uh, have it ready for us. Uh, additionally, let's talk about the fact that we have our, our SAC COC visit coming up in the first week of April. I know you've been briefed on that over and over and over again. But bear in mind that on-site visit, one of the key things that they're focused on is the quality enhancement plan of the QOB. And I've been on a number of sex visits. It is not a regular for somebody to walk up and see David Newton at the Starbucks and go, hey, tell me about your QEP, which sounds awkward, but it really is an assessment because if David goes, gosh, I really don't know anything about it, we can get cited uh, by that on-site committee, and then we have to go through the process of going rectifying that with SAC COC. Uh, that's why we put out today from the desk of the president, uh, plus uh, uh, we'll distribute it through other channels, a series of videos that walks you through the process of how the QEP was developed, uh, what it focuses on, and that's career readiness and experiential learning for almost everybody in this room. You're already engaged in many of those activities, but it's really, really important that across the entire university, people have familiarity with that plan and uh, the, the types of transformations that it brings uh, to the students of the University of West Georgia. Uh, any other questions on the uh, SAC COC visit? I think if you, if you are critical to being on campus during that time, you've already been contacted and scheduled in uh, to that end. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you have any questions, we'll save those till the end. Men's basketball won the Gulf South Championship on Sunday, uh, and it was it was pretty neat. Pretty neat to watch a team who won the regular season and was able to cut down a net uh, and then uh, uh, win the Gulf South Championship uh, and cut down the net at Sanford uh, University. And their net uh, cost the same as us, despite their tuition differences. Uh, that's, <laughs> next, uh, next, they'll be playing in the NCAA tournament. That starts tomorrow in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, it will be broadcast if you go to uh, the NCAA. They'll they'll have a, a feed for that game. Uh, but really exciting development for that program and that team. Uh, additionally, let me give you new leaders. Uh, I, I don't think this comes as news to anybody, uh, but I, I have appointed Allison Bretsch as uh, our new interim vice president for university advancement and interim CEO over our uh, philanthropic corporations. Uh, bear in mind, we have four corporations uh, for the university. She serves as uh, you know, a, a fiscal agent for all, but a, a specific oversight over two of those, it's the philanthropic foundation and the athletic foundation. Uh, she's been doing a great job as she is 15 days into her new life. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'll, I'll just mark it with enrollment. Uh, we are just about to get you know, the statewide enrollment reports. Those should be uh, coming out in pretty short course. Uh, we do anticipate to see uh, our continued growth as a university, which has been uh, pretty remarkable over the last uh, 24 months. Uh, and that is... Uh, really uh, very specifically uh, due to retention. Uh, 
uh, much higher retention than we have experienced in the past, as well as a wide variety of different new program growth. Uh, but those retention rates are, are a key factor. I raise that because that is the number one thing that we should always be working on, is making certain that we are in service to people and we're able to continue to choose the University of West Georgia. I will end my comments there. Any questions on any topics? Please. I have my user question. <laughs> How much? <laughs> Thank you very much for reporting the good news that a substantial fraction of the $1.6 million have been restored for fiscal year 2024. Uh, I want to make a broad request that I have previously done for money for professional development funds. In many disciplines, including the National Sciences, faculty development funds strongly support the QDP because uh, in the National Sciences and many other disciplines, for example, we we'll buy supplies and materials that are used by students in faculty directed research and scholarly and creative work. Every dollar helps. Thank you very much. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Every dollar does help. I did pass your request along to the provost in a more formal way after our last meeting. Bear in mind that, that the, the money we are getting returned was a cut. So we do have to go back and do restoration first. But uh, I took your message uh, more broadly than just that, you know, kind of that uh, uh, particular set of dollars so that we could uh, work on faculty development or, or resourcing that type of work uh, in more robust ways moving forward. Look, at, there are better financial times ahead. We know that. Enrollment growth creates better financial times ahead. They just don't come for uh, two years in the state of Georgia. So when we talk about that type of enhancement, uh, whether it's today or whether it's uh, uh, six months from now, whenever, it is uh, on the priority list for sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Others? Any time? Please. Um, I read very quickly um, the government's uh, wage increase for uh, university professors. And if I'm reading it correctly, there's a cap for the salary. Is that right? Do you know what that cap is? Yeah, it's a three thousand dollar cap. So it's a it's four percent up to three three thousand dollars. Five to a certain salary or a salary at which you don't get. Oh, I see what you like. Is there a for anybody making less than right? right. No, there is no cap. I heard that rumor. Oh. I think Dr. Weber passed along that rumor. Oh. Somebody, no. somebody, no, no, not started the rumor. Passed along the rumor. <laughs> No, that is, uh, there is no salary definition. No, that's happened in the state. There's no salary definition uh, in that. So when they say 4% cap of 3,000, that applies to every state employee in the state of Georgia. And it has gone unchanged so far. Now, Sarah Powell, because you look at the skeptical look on her face, she will say, right, but it's in the Senate. So we don't know what happens. But no, at this point, that is that, that does not apply. You remember, I believe the governor made made a move like that a few years ago, but that was trying to correct some uh, uh, salary issues in, in kind of lower tier salaries across the state. Thank you. It's a great question. Please. Yesterday, a oh, we got an email about a policy change for clear bags for events. Yes. Uh, but the comment committee has intended to be a so I don't understand how the policy is going through without the, the view of green being on the board. Yeah, uh, I can't answer that specific question. I have to go. I, I have to go check with uh, with the general counsel's office who runs policy staff. So I will. I'll follow up on that piece. Uh, but I will address the clear bag piece. We are as we move into Division One athletics, but more importantly, uh, we have to enhance some of our security uh, uh, protocols as a university. We have a lot of large events. Uh, and other institutions, whether professional or uh, universities, utilize security protocols to make certain that uh, we recognize the world that we live in. That one is uh, is a common one. I believe the clear bag policy that's being uh, put out for next time is one that is uh, I don't know if it's taken it's taken from another university. I just don't know which one. Uh, which is often what we do. We go through policies that have already been. Uh, uh, kind of works through inside of a USG institution. 
And we had not for that. We had campus carry where people carry a gun in a penetrating it's concealed. But we're asking to see what people are carrying in their bag. Yes. Doesn't make sense. At a mass event and a largely attended event, it does. Theater music and other events. Uh, yeah, it, so so for theater and music, that's a uh, may be in, in, in force, right? So uh, that is not a have to, it's a may be in force. And UPD will make the determination about when that clear bag policy is in place. And any of those events, you'll have forward notice for any attendee about it being in place. So we're not to the full implementation of that. But I but I mean let's just take a commencement. Uh, on commencement day, we're going to host at least 15,000 to 20,000 people uh, uh, in one building. Uh, the safety protocols that we use have to match anybody else who has 15 to 20,000 people gather together in one building. Uh, so we'll work through whatever the exceptions to that. I mean, I imagine if I'm going to a show in the lab theater, you know, and we're seating 100 people there, uh, or whatever the, the capacity is, but probably not a clear bag uh, situation. Others. Let's see what her concern is that like it's very carry the gun in on the body of the right? Uh, I have to ask actually I'd have to ask the I have to ask Chief that question. Uh, because even if you if you have a clear bag policy, sometimes it's just recognition, like and I, I, let me let me get that that from you because we're just as we endeavor into that type of security protocol and some others, uh, you know, access points in buildings are going to have to be adjusted. We have some very familial approaches to access points in buildings during large events that we have to uh, we have to end. Remember that this isn't just anticipating things. This is uh, uh, based on what's happening in our environment right now, too. So we're trying to adjust our security protocols to make certain we're not the university who uh, has to say, uh, why didn't we when something bad happens? So we will, I, I'll, I'm going to ask Kristen Carr, General Counsel, and Chief Watson uh, to work back through those concerns and get more clarity because I do, uh, I, I brought up the same exact issue on uh, uh, some of the lack of clarity and I appreciate you saying about theater. But there, there are certain events where it just doesn't make sense. Others? Please. Uh, I haven't heard anything about projections for the fall yeah, I have. Yes, I have all of that. Uh, I don't know if I have direct access to it right now. So I'll give you a two, kind of a two chapter uh, look at fall. One, uh, everything at the University of West Georgia is trending up in nearly every access point. And that includes dual enrollment. You know, we, uh, we matriculate a higher percentage of dual enrollment students into undergraduate, uh, full-time undergraduates than any other university I've been part of. And we outpace many, many other universities, which has been uh, fantastic. So uh, yes, applications are up and, and it varies from week to week based on processing. Generally speaking, the trend uh, looks up. Um, but there is, a, there is a facet that everybody should be keenly aware of. Uh, the United States Congress passed a law that required the, uh, the Department of Education to redo and simplify the FAFSA. And uh, I think for those of you who are familiar with FAFSA, it's already very complicated to fill out. Uh, their simplification by law had to be done by December 31st. So on January 1st, they did, re they did release something. Uh, and... Uh, out of the millions and millions of people who would have accessed it, I think they they got like 250,000 people. Uh, that is an ongoing issue for us. That's an ongoing issue for every university in the United States. So we're all in the same boat. That is a risk. That's a risk for everybody just because I don't know that we're going to get great access to the FAFSA. And it's not us filling it out and submitting it. It's the federal government turning it around and getting back to institutions so we can create financial aid packages. Uh, that holds up almost everything. We are probably, from what uh, 
uh, Leanne has said recently, I think we're six weeks away, six weeks away from uh, starting to be able to uh, really fulfill all of those packages. That's a couple months after we would normally do that process. Since every institution in the country is in the same boat and we are ready to do that and we'll work 24 hours a day to turn those around, I don't feel right now like that is a huge risk, but it is something that should be in people's minds. Uh, because if we start uh, a fall semester and you are an incoming student, and I worry less about the students that are already attending the university because we can communicate with them differently and they've been through these processes. But if I'm an incoming student and I don't have my financial aid package in place, so I don't know exactly what I'm endeavoring into from a financial perspective, uh, I might just choose not to participate. Now, we are very lucky to have Lee Ann as our financial aid director. And I say that because she is the president-elect for the Southern Association of Financial Aid Directors. And I know what you're thinking. It sounds like a party organization. It's not. Uh, but, but she will report most, most people in, in that area in financial aid uh, don't feel very well supported by their institutions and they don't feel very well included by the institutions, even though uh, basically, none of us can do our jobs without them doing theirs first and then doing it well. Uh, so Leanne's leadership, uh, and that includes her going up to uh, Virginia Fox uh, and uh, with other financial aid leaders and meeting with them uh, at the United States Congress uh, to talk about how they need to push uh, the Department of Education. I met with the Assistant Secretary of Education uh, for the federal department uh, with a number of other presidents a few weeks ago uh, so that we could spend an hour uh, explaining all of the reasons why they need to move uh, much, much faster. Uh, but outside of that chapter two risk, uh, we are, are trending up in the same fashion we have in you know, the last three or four semesters. It's a great question. I will make a note to, we should have uh, kind of better, I'll, have, I'll bring some better enrollment statistics for our April meeting and share all of those with you. Any final questions for the president? Please. Question maybe more for Sarah. What are the conversations around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at the Capitol, and how might they impact us here? So, um, the Conversations about that at the Capitol certainly do affect our environments across the state. Um, I can't, I, I don't want to speak specifically on any bill. Um, I want to make sure I have all the right information for you. Um, but I will just say generally, those attitudes by our elected officials do affect everything in our state. Um, so I can follow up with you about more specific things, but I just want to make sure I have the, all the information I need for you. And I'll address that generally. There's There are robust conversations, uh, and I don't think that's news to anybody that's happening all over the United States. Um, and uh, there's, there is, uh, those are being turned into policy, uh, which will change the nature of our work. But I think from a specific perspective, I think Sarah's right. Let's go and gather that information to share it out. Others? I'm trying to ask if you all might have to do things differently, but is that mean that we won't do it? It depends on what need to it depends on what you mean by need to do. We've had a lot of counties there. Uh not lose ground. And again, we have to define what that means to. It's, it, there's a very specific conversation now, and there's types of activities that uh, we have a lot of leaders who um, uh, would argue that they are antithetical to what we're supposed to be doing as a public agency, right? As a public asset. Uh, uh, does it result in a lesser student experience? No, I do not believe it has to be. Uh, does it uh, uh, result in a uh, 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 less richness of a university? No, I do not think it has to. It just depends on, you know, I like to, uh, I like to take up fights that uh, are worth taking up. And sometimes we fight over the wrong things. 
at universities. Uh, and it, that doesn't help our arguments in the public sphere. We have talked in this room many times about the fact that there are many, many people in the public sphere who criticize what we do, how we do it, and uh, what the outcomes are. It is incumbent upon us to go and demonstrate the level of value and richness and importance uh, in ways that are uh, not just confrontation, right? Uh, but are substantive in ways that affect their lives and businesses and communities, et cetera. I believe we have the capacity uh, to do that uh, all day and every day, as long as we're focused on the right things too. Okay, thank you. Wait, I don't know. Oh. So you made a comment um, at the beginning of what you were saying about this issue that uh, uh, students are raising was not on your desk. Is it still not your problem? No, so let me clarify what I mean. We have uh, we have processes where you know faculty make recommendations to deans, uh, deans make recommendations to in this case another dean and then provost. So it becomes my desk once it comes from the provost. And if it doesn't, if I kind of sweep in, uh, then we start to go. Well, how can how can deans go and do their jobs? How can faculty go and do their jobs? So we try to respect people's boundaries and the roles that they play at the university and allow them to lead in that space without me, who's the executive head of the university uh, and has the authority to get involved at any point, uh, compromising. Otherwise, and I'll go back to it, then why do we have all of these people who are leading the subject matter experts? That's what I mean. So when it comes from the provost, that's what becomes my issue. Okay, thank you. Great. The provost's uh, report, you should have received that letter, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it, at least parts of it. Well, I'm going to read all of it so we can just be on the same page. You didn't have the chance, and also for the sake of our visitors so they can be aware of it as well. Thank you for your email yesterday in preparation for tomorrow's faculty senate meeting. As always, I appreciate you providing a heads up about topics of interest that we can process or address proactively. This is quite helpful to encourage dialogue and resolution of items important to faculty. Regrettably and unavoidably, I must attend to a personal family matter and won't be able to attend tomorrow. But please convey my support of faculty and their work that the uh, SAC COC preparation for the on-site visit that will occur April 1 through 4 is going very well. And I have every confidence that UWG will be able to clearly articulate how we are fully meeting all SAC COC standards. And that I look forward to providing updates on the AHSS, CMCS, and IMHW, that's Institute of Mental Health and Wellness, working groups at our next meeting in April. Further, based on the internet, uh, on the interest, sorry, to discuss graduate stipends and support for graduate programs, the following are updates specific to a recent inquiry regarding graduate stipend support. Dr. Varga, thank you for being here, will be available at the Faculty Senate meeting to pro provide an overview of the process and answer questions. Given that there is an already scheduled meeting of, of program coordinators and Drs. Varga and Gagnon for next week, it will be most fruitful to allow specifics of the inquiry regarding graduate stipends for the PhD psychology program to be discussed and resolved at that meeting. Dr. Varga can clarify correct, but the improved, more equitable process for request and granting of graduate assistantship has been implemented during this past review cycle, beginning with faculty requesting positions the college school slash school deans reviewing the request and passing their affirmation and support to the graduate school dean. The institution level review conducted and allocations returned to the college slash school deans. I will add that the distribution of graduate stipend and graduate program, program support has shifted in the past three years to more align with enrollment per program. In the past, CAXI programs accounted for approximately 20% of graduate enrollment though they receive the majority of funding. CAXI receives a smaller portion of the funding going into FY25 than it has received in past fiscal years, but the support received continues to outpace the percentage of enrollment slash SCH that CAXI generates. While this change may be felt in some graduate programs and perceived as a challenge, the shift is important and appropriate given the enrollment and growth in other areas, just as we shift other operating and personnel financial support towards growing programs. 
I and the UWG leadership team remain committed to expanding support and funding in er any area that grows, regardless of academic discipline or college slash school. With respect to the specific inquiry about the PhD psychology assistantships, I defer to Drs. Gagnon and Varga to expand and clarify when the program coordinators and they meet next week, as this is a matter best focused locally between those who lead the program and the administrative leaders who have reviewed the assistantship requests and allocated funding in support of the program. It is my understanding that the PhD psychology assistantship request from Dr. Gagnon received by the graduate school was fully funded. I welcome further discussion thereafter if questions remain. Thank you for your leadership. Well, I won't read the rest of that, but he does look forward to um, working alongside the faculty and leadership of AHSS. So that second hour discussion will be valuable for sure. Okay, so I just wanted to read that. That's his report. He did say that we would have guests, uh, Dr. Varga, Dr. Dr. Gagnon are here to clarify, to review, to do you want to speak first? Do you want to take questions? What would be your preference? Uh, I can reiterate kind of what Dr. Dr. Brunson indicated that the process, particularly the feedback from faculty senate last year, was modified to include uh, graduate program council's advisory of participation in that. Uh, and this year, I really tried to work closely with the deans in determining overall their needs and their priorities, specifically for their colleges, which can vary across the board. They know their teaching load, they know their faculty, they know their priorities. They know all of those things much better than I do. Um, so really trying to work through all of that. Process starts in October and um, ends in what's called my movement, middle of February. Uh, so that goes to show you how long the process is to ensure that we have that much feedback and participation uh, within the process. Um, that's kind of where I am in terms of that role. I'm at the end, after I get the recommendations, I'll review them and then um, put the board to the provost's office. Uh, that's kind of that, as Dr. Preston indicated, that overview of the process as a whole. Okay. Anything to add from, from Paxi, or do you want to wait on questions? Yes, I'd like to just point out the fact that when you have to prioritize funding, as everyone in this room knows, including the students, is that there's only so much money coming in. And you have to prioritize accordingly. You have to look at a lot of the nuanced differences between programs, what their needs are. Uh, we always do champion student need in everything we do in the college. And, and particularly, it's difficult, I know, when there's not as much money to go around. So I will emphasize the fact that we did prioritize student need. But often, I think programs are not aware of needs of other programs, although we do discuss that pretty often at the chair table. And, and in this case, we did as well talk about how, you know, perhaps psychology might have felt slighted, but at the same time, we had multiple needs in the, in, in the college. Okay. Um, with that said, we're going to go ahead and uh, open for questions, uh, which Dr. Preston noted would be fine, and I think is fine as well. I do want to note, we want to give Dr. Moser some time. We also have that second hour. So let's let's try to, to go um, just to like five before the hour or so, if we can. But please, questions? Wait. How many issues do you have uh, to award um, graduates of employment this year? And then how does that compare with last year? So this year, we had roughly um, 730,000 allocated for assistantship funding. And then with that, working each individual college and uh, their individual needs, disbursements were made to those individual colleges. How does that compare with last year? You said 730,000? 730,000. And then last year, uh, it was about 800,000. Thank you. Other questions? Or... Please. All graduate assistantships. And I understand 
what uh, the Thomas Dean are saying, what you are saying, what the Greens are saying, and that is now for something like union. Still, we have really that we have to take issue and we want to raise a couple of questions, even if we feel they might be redundant, that they need to be heard in this body. Specifically, also for the students here who have their voices on their posters. So, my first question, and I come here with questions connected from biology faculty who feel concerned about the enrollment of their students, who feel concerned about the success of their students, who feel concerned about the career readiness of their students. Exactly what is to be pointed out by the QEP uh, criteria, right? Okay, so let's. I'm see. glad you know that, by the way. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> yes. Yes, I know you are glad. <laughs> so, why did Paxton only get a decreased funding of 250K this year, <laughs> which makes the decision we are facing in this background? It explains what we are facing now. And I don't see this, I see this decrease in funding making only certain very specific decisions possible. So why is this decree to taxi with 250K? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. No, that yeah. That's Provo's question. Yeah, please. Um, if we can go scroll back up. Can you scroll back up? I'm sorry. Larissa Cecile, it is noted here, taxi programs accounted for, you know, the 20%, less than 20% of graduate enrollment, and they were receiving the majority of funding. And since the emphasis has been on the revenue from the student credit hours, um, I believe that Dr. and I don't want to speak for Dr. Preston, but I believe what he's saying here is that he wanted to reset the distribution of the monies based on the student credit average generation. I don't know, Dr. Barger, or Jim, if you can do that, but I think that's what he's speaking to in this in this um, memo. So this was the criteria you used to assess the graduate assistantship request that were coming to you. Multiple nuances in, in in addition to student credit hour production, because I have to also look at the state of the programs individually. I'll give you an example. Uh, psychology does have and enjoys a part time budget that allows for um, there hasn't been a decrease in your part time hirings. You've been able to continue your part time hirings and find the fact that you have access to part time funds. Uh, biology, on the other extreme, does not have access to part-time funds. So when there's only so many dollars to go around, I have to recognize the fact that there are nuanced differences in the programs themselves. So again, it boils down to the money that I had to distribute is based on this percentage of graduate enrollment. And then further distribution I take into account as an example the differences in the programs and what their different needs are. I had to look at the whole picture of the other funding or the other funding sources as well. Did you have anything? It, it, it's because of those nuances, we modified the process from last year to really work with the deans and, and have those aspects. If, um, if that's on such a specific level that, um, frankly, last year we, we missed the mark on and wanted to work more closely with the deans to be able to do that. I hope that addresses your question. Yeah. Question here? Uh, two. Yeah. Nice and loud. It's gotten a little noisy in the room. Gotcha. Sorry. Uh, uh, and I feel none of the good degree of freedom that we have here to choose the areas of study that we have to be But we have to give us some views. We could have just promises, anomalous experiences, which, according to Thomas Dewey, could be the thrust of what we need to really understand consciousness. And it's super concerned that the funding for this program that we have in students, the 
future of the program, not just for us, but for the world. That is what I understand. So I understand that. Thank you. No, I think I fully understand and appreciate the passion of the and I have a great consciousness of PhD is one of the very few in the country, one that we are very proud of. Um, and it is one that Dr. Preston and Dr. Kelly and Dr. Gagnon have all agreed that uh, we still fully support and encourage the, the program as a whole. It's one that, you know, as a graduate dean, I like to go out and talk to them, uh, and talk about. So, you know, and the fact that you all are here, I think also speaks volumes to your commitment and your passion to the program and your people. Um, so, you know, in terms of the specifics, I can't really talk about the kind of broad picture. I, I completely agree with that. So, you know, like this is how it happens. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I feel like this will, could really resonate with community members, alumni, and people in the specialty field that we represent. Uh, and so there are not traditional ways of funding the program that we start to do. I understand that this is a systemic problem across different universities right now. Can we try to get ahead of the sort of problem? Everything, you know, the world is in crisis right now in so many different ways. So many different industries are going to have to figure out how to invent. We can get ahead of it and figure out some new ways to do this. I'd like to answer that. I appreciate that. And I think we have to think big. And, and I do think we have to look at alternative funding sources. And I think this is a message that is not new. And, and I appreciate you raising it because we do have a strong alumni base. So, right there is a possible revenue source uh, in terms of gifts. Uh, there's also grants, and, and I know we're supposed to be speaking, Brian will be speaking later about, you know, numerous labs in the psychology, or in the psychology program. Um, assistance with generating funds from those labs. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at creatively to find sources for the problems that we're passionate about. So absolutely. Thank you. Michael. I'm not, I'm going to ask my questions and then whoever feels like they got the information. It deals with sort of a little bit of economics. I know that a lot of the work done by the psychology graduate students, especially the PhD graduate students, was the teaching psychology 1101. So I want to ask a question about if the alternative is they're not a graduate assistant teaching that class and they need an adjunct. Can someone speak to which one is more cost beneficial, like in dollars and cents terms, in terms of that? Especially considering, are, do we have adjuncts available? Will it be the PhD graduate students or who are they hired as an adjunct? And if so, it's a direct question of the money that the speakers is the same person for hiring. And I did overhear Dr. Gavin say in the earlier that. That isn't necessarily the best comparison between departments because another department may not need their graduate assistant to teach an introductory course, but they do need them to do particular work that is common to this art. But I would like you all to speak a little bit to that in terms of how you calculate. So, kind of two different questions. Yeah, so I can start off by saying that when we consider the full package in terms of the stipend, the tuition, uh, and in some institutions, tuition waivers are actually paid by the departments. Uh, at the University of West Georgia with tuition waivers, it's just literally just waived. Um, so with which, that, which let's note though, the, but it does show up as a cost. So yes, that's exactly. we, we we absorb it centrally, but it is on the books as a cost. Yes, that's exactly. What it's so with that, we consider that as the dollar in terms of the cost of the institution, in addition to the stipend. Once we break that down, it actually becomes more. Uh, the, the dollar wise funding GTAs is higher than it is at adjuncts. Um, now, I, I can say this is a little more of Dean Gagnon, but I can say that GTAs, and maybe Marisa Steele, you can speak to this as well, that either um, previous graduates of the program have served as adjuncts um, before. I, I know a couple personally. Um, so, those are certainly there. So, in terms of the specifics, that, that's what I have to offer that. And I think that's a narrative. I'm glad you raised that line because sometimes the narrative is that we somehow earn revenue when we provide a waiver for a graduate student. But 
as Dr. Kelly pointed out, it's a cost. I mean, a waiver is not free. It, 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 there's a cost involved. And it is true that when you're doing a comparison, the part time ends up being more cost efficient. That's absolutely true. I would like to um, add a point to that and also ask a question about marketing. Um, but some of the adjunct um, instructors that could be hired might just have master's degrees and they would not have the same training that we get as a PhD student. So our first semester we serve as a graduate research assistant, and then for two semesters following we're trained by the UWG faculty uh, in two separate teaching practicum courses in order to effectively teach introduction to general psychology. An adjunct that may be hired will not potentially not have that training. Um, so, in my opinion, that causes the undergraduates um, to suffer um, and not receive um, as good of an education in that classroom. Can I ask a question on that point? I'm okay. ignorant. How many classes is a, is a graduate student teaching in, we, in their GPA position? So, all of us teach one intro class every semester. And there are four to 500, I believe it could be more than that, um, undergraduate students majoring in psychology um, who certainly need this to be a well executed class, uh, of course, in addition to it being a four class for all of the undergraduate students. Um, but my question is in regards to um, marketing um, to increase enrollment. Since um, Cassie was only 20%. Um, of graduate students that enrolled. I'm curious about how um, the marketing budget to increase enrollment is allocated to the different colleges. And if we receive less um, allocation in that budget to help increase uh, our enrollment numbers. Um, but I would also like to add to Nikki's um, point that we are one of only two universities in the US where you can study transpersonal psychology come from all over the world to attend our program. So I'll let you answer the question about the market. I'll take the marketing. Okay. Uh, so we do, we jump around on programmatic specific. Most of our marketing is more generalized. It's about the University of Westwood rather than specific programs. But the provost will uh, work with the deans and they and kind of narrow that. And then we, we, we do push some programs each year. Uh, but we have so many programs, you can't, we don't actually market program by program, it doesn't get distributed that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really has to do with, you know, if, a, if we have a program that's growing uh, very quickly, uh, education, for instance, has some uh, programs that are growing very quickly. We don't invest marketing dollars in that because it's happening organically. There are some places where we might introduce a new program, new program specific marketing, but it doesn't get distributed by college. It's really, University of West Georgia that's based on a set of data that we do uh, about every three years so that we assess our prospective uh, audiences, prospective uh, student audiences and people that are surrounding them to figure out you know, kind of what programs do they know about, uh, what are we known for, how deep has that market or how uh, deeply has our brand penetrated. And then we take that data and we turn it into marketing strategy. So it's, it varies by year with some programmatic specific uh, work. Thank you. So that, uh, in, you mentioned CLE program enrolling. It's true we don't do a lot of targeted marketing at the university level, but I can speak to the department and program individually doing a lot of, I don't know if you consider it guerrilla marketing or whatever, but having <laughs> online interest sessions for prospective students, for sending out our own mailings, we have a robust social media, uh, presence from attending conferences and, and so we we are marketing it's just uh maybe not we're not asking for as many resources yeah can we, i i think that's so important i know we're out of time dr river my apologies that the guerrilla marketing piece is so important i had uh you know I, i've done uh, yesterday with a uh a three-time coe grant they came in because some other COE grad said, you should go to West Georgia. They stayed because they kept getting uh, pulled in. It, there's a lot of cross-section. We do that with every single program. It's not just alumni. The more we push our own programs, and I'm saying this is credit, I don't have one program. I push everything. But the more, the more each individual area 
demonstrates that enthusiasm, puts the word out. We, we see a tremendous amount of value in that. Those are uh, earned marketing dollars uh, in, in such uh, 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 impactful ways. Uh, you see it all over the university. So if we have to, well, I didn't, I knew I was going to decide. Oh, thank, thank you, Gavin. But uh, <laughs> I would encourage, I would encourage everybody to advocate for the programs in the same way, in whatever way it is possible for them. So uh, I love that question, and the real marketing does work. How can we effectively do that when once had the partner program Instagram accounts and they were taken away from us? Oh, I think we, we we do do that. Okay, so one, the audiences for those were very small. You're seeing growing audiences on more consolidated channels. We had 208, 18 or 81 different Instagram accounts. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, as a person with a PhD in communication, who specifically, this is my area of expertise, that is a terrible strategy. Consolidating around channels so that, and I'll use Caxi as a good example, so that you're advocating for all of the kind of spirit, texture, community, and specific programs that exist inside of it is a more effective strategy than the broader audience. So that, that you still have that capacity. Every program has that capacity. It's just not so narrow uh, in, in terms of its audience acquisition. I'm going, to, I'm going to take two short questions or comments. Yeah, uh, I just want to introduce myself to the bear myself quick. My name is Joe Donald, I'm a PhD student at the University of Westberger uh, with the psychology department. I just want to see a raise of hands if you have a PhD in this room. How many of you have received funding while you were in your program? How many of you were parents while you were in that program? How many of you worked full time while you were in that program? Okay. You're, you were in the exact same position that we were in. A little bit about my background, I did two combat tours. I'm a combat veteran for the United States Marine Corps. I'm a PhD student. I'm a single mother to a child that has one functioning kidney. Last year, we went through 15 surgeries. I also am the director of community outreach and development for the Utah Habitat for Humanity. Times are different now. The average two-bedroom apartment in Carrollton and Newton is $1,800. We have students that cannot afford that, that are sleeping in their vehicles, that are skipping meals, and eating. This is the only safe place we have. This is the only thing we have. So many of us have given up so many aspects of our lives. We, on top of working 40 hours a week, we're working 20 hours a week as a graduate research assistant. We're working in classes and we're still having to work full time and provide for our families. Please. Take into consideration what we've been through and what you went through when you were in our exact same shoes when you were making these decisions. Thank you. Then I got it. Yeah, sir. Sure. Um, hello, my name is David Glazier. I am the assistant professor of psychology. Um, here, I'm also the head of the Bachelor of Science program uh, in psychology. And I'm here in solidarity with the students. Um, I think that uh, the cause is, is very, very important. So I have a, a very brief question, sort of a two-part question. Um, so, so two parts. There's, there's, there's a commitment to increase the number of graduate programs and seats at our program, yet there's also a reduction in the funding for GR positions. How does that align? Those two seem to be disconnected. And secondly, given the UWG emphasis emphasis on research accomplishments at all levels, including undergraduate research initiatives and the recent growth in graduate enrollment, how would the elimination, how would the elimination of GRA positions be in line with these goals? So in terms of the first question, I'll add that this, this academic year, I believe the master's program in psychology increased Quite a bit. The number of applications increased, the growth increased, um, and and you know it was, it was uh, a lot of praise went went around that. I think one thing that we really tried to do is that help people understand that not all students want an assistantship. And one thing that we are committed to is consistently trying to increase uh, the stipends and the financial applications. Dr. Kelly is. We had a conversation about that this morning. About trying to ensure that we are raising these stipends and costs for, for students. Um, 
So I know they may sound tied to one another, but they, they could also very well be mutually exclusive as well. Um, and that's one thing that we try to work through. And as a graduate school, we're committed to helping programs reach out, have connections, have these partnerships, uh, help this guerrilla campaigning to grow. Uh, when I was a program coordinator, I felt like guerrilla campaigning was a lot of what I did at the height. We had 60 students in, in the College Student Affairs program. Uh, so I, I completely understand you know, that overall perspective. Uh, and without, even though the GRA positions, there may not be something in psychology, we have a plethora of other options across the university as well that provide the assistantship, that provide stipends, that provide tuition waivers. We have scholarships, uh, which I'm happy to send all that information out to individuals that um, you know want to be able to apply for those access to those positions, but now being posted, um, literally posted probably uh, 15 or 20 today alone. Uh, so it's it's there, it's, it's coming. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I, and to echo what has been said, there are other units that have offerings in for graduate students. Um, in, in, in terms of your background, sorry, your name, Joe. Joe. In terms of your background, uh, we have an office that's dedicated to helping our vets on campus, and I'm hoping that if you haven't already, that you can take advantage of that. But again, we're limited in the funding, and we have to make hard decisions based on how much money we have. It's like anybody has to do with their monthly budget. Uh, there's needs and there's wants. And 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 I don't and I and I don't disagree with anything that was said here um, today, and certainly not by the students. I understand your passion and your needs. But with limited funding, we have to prioritize. And I do think that it's a good idea to look at some of these other units and these other needs for students to be able to work on campus and ways that we can be creative to find ways to help these students. No matter what program. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the time. Um, I want to. Oh, Clint. I guess I'm not sorry. I'll let you speak too if he gets to speak. This is great. I handle marketing for our college. I love hearing your story. Now, my guess is that y'all come here today with your signs. I'm an art professor, by the way, and I think you did a good job with your signs, all right? Uh, but I just want to say that if you were to reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to provide the resources for the marketing promotion uh, at the college level. Uh, you know, like your story, I'm pretty powerful. You know, to share that, I think that would be great. If you have other stories, we are more than happy to use that in a positive way to help the program. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned uh, as a PhD student, and I'm a very passionate professor here. I love my students, and I love teaching. Um, but I'm a little concerned about this conversation and just how often uh, it seems the, the things driving the decision-making process seem to be almost exclusively fiscal and monetary, which I understand. You know, we've got to keep the ship afloat institutionally nationwide right now. We're really facing a crisis in budgeting. Uh, but I, I really see it as almost a diminishing of the institution of higher education itself if factors such as educational value, legacy, uniqueness are not really considered in a way that we can actually see incorporated into the budgeting process. Uh, I myself, I, I was a really passionate student. Uh, I graduated from Clark University in Massachusetts, um, almost double major in psychology and philosophy. Um, and while there, I worked really closely with two professors from two different departments. Uh, one of them, Professor Michael Bamberg, uh, another one, uh, Professor Charles DeMarco, both very successful in their respective fields. Uh, and so after graduating, I, of course, knew I was going to go to graduate school. So I asked them, uh, what do you think is the best school for me? And without talking to one another, they both immediately said, the University of West Georgia is a perfect fit for you. I asked them if there are any other similar institutions, and they said, hmm, you know, may maybe the City University of New York uh, in New York City, but besides that, no, and West Georgia is your best bet. Uh, so I, I would just ask you uh, to, to consider uh, the legacy of this program in the budgeting decisions, um, and also that it's renowned uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, so can, can you comment in what ways these uh, aspects of the program are, are factored into these decisions? very aware of the legacy. I've been here for over 30 years, and I, I know, and, and friends with many people in the psychology program, and, and it's something that we are very, very proud of, uh, not only in the college, but in the university. And you have many, many alums 
all over the world. And they too have, you know, wonderful, wonderful experience here and great memories. And some contribute. I think that we need to tap into that legacy. And I think that there are ways that we can tap into that legacy even more and, and draw some, some, some funds from that in order to continue the kind of support that you all need. Yeah, I, I would really hope so. Just because if we were called and raising hands uh, when uh, my colleague Joe asked how many were funded during the PhD programs, I think if we're being realistic and honest with ourselves, if we cut the funding for the PhDs, like this thing from class was not offered any form of financial support, eventually the program is going to die out. So let me stop there. Thank you for trying to apply by the time. Five after is as good as five before. Uh, but, but let me elevate to the Senate level for a moment, because there are a lot of senators here, and I, I do have a psychology hat, and it's very much involved in, in my heart and my thoughts about what I'm hearing. But now I'm putting on my, my faculty senator hat. The, the regret I have is that since I took on this position a year and a half plus ago, the, the thing I said to the president and provost and the thing I've said to you and I feel strongly about is that the faculty of this university have brilliant minds, great ideas, and a capacity to make decisions with the administrative arm in shared governance that can bring about really good outcomes. And including the faculty only does well. My concern and my regret is that, and I think we've made a lot of great progress in working as a Senate hand in hand with the administration. And one of the ways that happens is right in this meeting. We've changed the meeting agenda so that we can work together hand in hand on things of concern, workload, scheduling, intellectual property, academic integrity, our task forces, as well as our committees. The concern I have, I, I feel just a little regret, is in this particular case, as Senate Chair, I didn't know about this issue until two weeks ago. As a psychology faculty, I didn't know about it until two weeks ago. And it doesn't give us a chance to mobilize the faculty senate to work effectively with administration. And that to me is, I don't know, I'm not placing a blame, I'm not saying there's a fault, but it's a, another hurdle for us to overcome so that we can better collaborate and work together on things that come up that affect our students who we care deeply about. In this particular case, um, I think the decisions are made and, and this year is in place, but we have to be involved in working together with the administration for what comes next. This is the only body that represents every graduate program at the university. And I can tell you, because I have a daughter getting an EDD in education right now, and I teach in the site PhD program, that those are different kinds of grad students and different kinds of programs. And only the faculty can speak for those programs on behalf of their students, making those differences known to administrators so you can know how to best manage those funds. There are very different kinds of students in our programs often. And if we're not aware of that, which faculty are your best source of awareness, then we might make decisions that we have to post hoc examine rather than prior to the decision exam. I know we have limited resources. I know there is hard decisions that have to be made. I also know we can mobilize faculty as soon as we have to, to try to address those decisions. And the Senate is the best body to do that. It's the only body that represents everybody. And I'm grateful our students are here to speak because they have a beautiful and powerful voice. But we as faculty have to speak on their behalf and we have to be able to speak with some influence and some power. And that only happens when my personal goal as Senate chair, but I think the right goal for this university is shared governance really does in fact work together. So I know many of you here are not aware of psychology maybe, you don't, you don't know these students as some of us do very well. And this might've felt like a discussion that wasn't relevant to you. I'm telling you it is relevant to you because the process by which the Senate works effectively, most effectively is when we are involved as early as possible, but involved in the activities, the decisions that affect the success of our students. So I do hope, my plea is for us as senators, but also for our administration, that on this particular issue, but others that will come, that we can continue to grow and improve in our joint action together. That we can work more effectively together because we can help in the decision process. We don't have to be the deciders, but we can certainly help in the decision process, even for things that 
prolonged with an administration in terms of those kind of decisions. So I do hope we can improve. I'm I'm in the sunset of my time as faculty senate chair, but in my last time, I'm going to continue to work on that. And I hope whoever will take over will continue the momentum we have built. And this is a, a positive as much as it is a call for improvement. I, I am really grateful to all of you and all of our administrators for the combined work we have done. I mean, we are making real progress on these tasks that we have task forces for. We are making amazing progress in our committees. We are more shared in our governance than we were two or three years ago. Does anyone disagree with that? We are more shared, but we have to get even better. And I see this as an opportunity, a, a point where we need to probably consider maybe another task force, right? How do we coordinate our work with the work of administration in things like graduate assistantships, resource and graduate programs? I know we have a GPC that does that work, but I think as a Senate, it might be something for us to consider. With that said, I want to thank again our students so much for coming and our guests who have come representing psychology and the college and the graduate school. Thank you for coming to the meeting. We're going to shift gears in just a minute, but I want to give Brian time and thank you for coming, representing ORS to speak about um, centers, if you'd like. Thank you. And uh, I will let the students know I appreciate you being here. I've worked with two psychology faculty members just this week on trying to uh, secure grant funding and work towards grant opportunities, which many times lead to graduate assistantship. So I will continue that work committed to do so. Um, it, thank you so much. You can see it's up on the screen here. Uh, this is a draft copy that has been sent to you. And so in the past, uh, not, again, I've, I've been in this position for just a little over a year as the interim director uh, on the Office of Research and Responsive Projects. I've enjoyed this position. I've met many of you in this room that I did not know before. And uh, it's been it's been my pleasure to do so. Uh, one of the things that we recognize is we don't have a formalized process on campus in terms of upstarting or or uh, securing access to a center or an institute. It happens, but there's not a formalized process in doing so. And so we have all types of different centers on campus, but in terms of USG, it's represented in two ways. And that if you just page it down just a little bit, that well, thank you. What you'll see here is 2.14, and that's a, a link. And again, you have access to this. These are the definitions as by USG of what centers are. And so you can see there's center characteristics for both of these. And the center characteristics for both of these, you can see the center is really tied to research. When you think about our centers on campus, Center of Academic, uh, academic Success or Momentum Center, it really doesn't align to what the center is. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be a center. It's just this is the broad definition that USG has for centers. And so there's some commonalities between centers and institutes. And those things are they work in interdisciplinary nature. That's great. Uh, they support research. Both of them do. Uh, they have other maybe revenue streams like continuing ed. And so all of those are tied to centers in our institutes. The real difference between centers and institutes is centers are not autonomous. They're usually tied to a department or some structure of the university. And then institutes are typically autonomous. So they, they can work on their own. Further, they also have the ability to have programs and or offer degree credit. And so those are those are really the two differences between centers and institutes. And so what we've done is we've looked at um, in, in uh, collaboration with the Office of Legal Affairs. Uh, Clint Baxter has done tremendous work on this, looking at all institutions, USGY, and how they define centers, how they define institutes, and how they function. And so we were able to look at uh, material from different institutions. We've come up with this as a draft model that has also been seen by the deans, and certainly I am hopeful that you as the representatives will bring this back to your departments and offer feedback. Uh, again, it's, it's a draft eventually that will go through the policy and procedures, just like everything that we have said that will formalize the process of one informing a center for an institute. I'll bring up a couple other pieces in this application and I can continue to pitch. Thank you so much. You can see that right here, uh, the center institute and classification here, this is UWG specific, this is not USG specific, but it helps us recognize the difference between 
an academic center, again, center for uh, academic success would be one momentum center, a research center uh, that would be very similar to the uh, uh, Center for Public History. You can see an outreach or service or extension, much like Center for Economic Education, Financial Literacy. Another example of that might be the Murphy Center. And then, and, uh, and then an outreach or service center, you can see that kind of, in some of these, I'm sorry, an institute, which we don't formally have one yet, but it looks like we, we um, it's on, it could potentially be an, an opportunity for us in the very near future. And then some are gonna cross over and have multiple aspects of these. So I think of the Center for Integrative Wellness. They help students in some ways. They have, they have research projects going on. They have grant projects going on. They're um, on the mobile unit, servicing uh, different different communities. So some of these cross over, but it helps us define what our centers are. Uh, you can see there's an opportunity for someone to, that would be upstarting the center to think about the internal and external funding that would be appropriate to start that center. And then, please page down some more, thank you so much. You can see that it asks for specifics about mission. How is this center or institute core, uh, critical to the core of the institution in the strategic group? What are the missions and values? What's the target audience? Who, who is the supporting and what services? So that would be something that uh, someone would fill out as well. A little bit more about the proposed center, the financial description and justification. I'll speak a little bit to this and then I'll should be wrapping up. So um, what someone would do in this is, pr is propose a timeline or a group of faculty, could be interdisciplinary in nature, to think about what, what's the timeline, what's the three-year trajectory. Ideally, centers should be something that would eventually be self-sustainable, especially the research-based centers. So they're looking at funding mechanisms so that if there's startup dollars uh, that are supported by the institution, that that center would, should be able to stand up and function on its own in terms of external dollars, continuing education, services, contracts, et cetera. So it's developing that plan. Uh, so this is the draft version of this. And I would certainly appreciate any feedback that you have. I appreciate feedback from uh, you as a representative. The faculty are, are more than welcome to talk through this. Again, and once that happens, we'll go through policy stat. That will be another opportunity for all faculty staff to speak into what this looks like. Questions? Yes. Is there special funding for a new center that is separate from the, the department funding? Is it something that is uniquely funded? This would be this would be an opportunity through the provost office which we uh, with an outside uh, the application is spelled out where there would be funding designed to start that center up outside the department. Does that answer your question? It does. Yes, Rob. Uh, yeah, so my question is about the last part you were discussing mm -hmm. funding and the sort of expectation of self sustaining uh, centers. Is that the case for current centers that we have on campus? And is there a way to imagine a center that is uh, maybe not, can't be monetized in the same way, but still has value to the institution and its mission? Students Certainly. And so if you can pinch back up for me just a bit, you'll see. I think uh, so. This gives us an opportunity for all centers, and I've been working with all center directors on exactly what this looks like. And so, depending on the the focus of the center, an academic support center is certainly going to be different, uh, funded differently. And uh, there's an appendix three in here. If you read through the definitions, so for example, the outreach, service, and extension center. Some of these, uh, by by definition, would be service provided to little or no cost. And so there's there's opportunities for it to be serviced that way. However, um, anytime and um, and I open uh, open to all faculty. Anytime there's an opportunity for us to secure external funding for projects, which other universities do all the time, and we do as well, and would like to do more of. Um, I'm, I welcome those conversations. We have a team dedicated to finding that. So it's not to say that uh, it will be funded completely by external dollars, but I think every center is a little bit different. But to answer your question, centers, uh, for example, a Center for Small Business and Development, uh, you know, they operate, and they're, they're completely grant funded on capacity, but they're not looking to secure other dollars. Their mission is already set with the grant that they already have. So it's just dependent on the center. One more question. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, the external theme base caught my eye, and I'm wondering conversations that you're having with continuing education. Here's the example. 
Members, uh, faculty, and communication students are frequently contacted by continuing education because there are businesses such as Greystone Power Company that want us to go there and do one-day workshops. We receive uh, a small compensation for that. It seems like there's a possibility for Com Studies to separate itself from continuing education and suggest, propose that we become our own center in which we spread the beauty of public speaking skills to organizations and companies throughout the Western region. That potentially creates a territorial issue, though, with continuing ed that might not be interested in losing that possibility. So help me. Sure. Yeah. So we've we've had some initial conversations with Marty, but that's a you can bring up a, a great point, Becca. So I think the the opportunity is the way the funding model for continuing ed and 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 where that lives and why that lives there. So uh, the fee based, for example, a, a, a lot of times the way and this would give us an opportunity to clarify here, hundred percent. But for example, the Wearing Lab, uh, you know, they're contract based fee service. So if, um, how we work with Con Ed needs to be considered further. I appreciate you bringing that up. You're going to take the course. Glad to hear that. You got it. But, but yeah. I think that it's a really good point. We've had other consultancies that have been built out in universities. We may, uh, you're raising something, I go, maybe we invent something new too. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be, well, we'll do it over in comp studies. Mm -hmm. But maybe you could, we could package that. So all of the talents there and Con Ed is really responsible for going and selling and making those contacts yeah. on behalf of that center, but a different revenue model so that right. the uh, the school enjoys, uh, you know, eating more of what it kills. Well, so our writing be. center has been the model for those of us in Con Study. Right? Our writing center on campus has been wonderful. It's yes. a source for our students and others. And so we were thinking about, okay, so we should have like a speech center that's sort of built off of that, but there's a potential for us to generate revenue for that rather than just asking the bosses to write bigger checks for us. to so, say, hey, we can generate some revenue on our own using this model. That's what I'm thinking. Very good. Yeah, we can leverage it so that it doesn't have to be an either or. Yeah, both 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 both. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to do a speed round on uh, committee chair and task force um, report. So, any updates from any committees or task forces, please? You have one? <laughs> yeah, but I said speed round. Speed round. <laughs> I just said faculty can be mobilized quickly. Come on. Come on. Um, and the full uh, provost uh, created a AI uh, task force on how we should or could react. Um, we finished that work, and Dr. Preston has now okay the document. I stress this isn't policy. This is well, that you were on that too. This isn't policy. These are just ideas. Um, I had, um, but I then spoke to Dr. Aiken. Dr. Preston has okay. I should make a speaker follow. Um, and now that document has been through Jason's committee, the TIA, not PLC, and it's now gone to other. But like you and uh, Matt and Mandy and stuff to see where we think it should go next before it comes to the Senate, hopefully in April. So that's moving towards the Senate uh, uh, hearing. Now, I must stress again, for rumor start, this is not policy, these are just ideas. It's just an idea uh, election. So no one's going to be told anything. Right, next. Um, oh, well, on that one, Mandy Campbell and Brian have been fantastic. All right. Okay. Migration meeting. Last month, Ariel Vaughan and I introduced this Google document um, uh, about where we put, where everyone put their concern. We collated that and we met with uh, uh, Greg God, Hugh Russell from MITS. I'm sure many of you have met him. We went through the 41 questions. There were some uh, several thematic issues. Um, I then spoke to Mandy and Brian at IFE again. I don't know what I do with them, but I don't know anything else. I think it's think really Thursday, six. And I've shared that document with them. So now they're even more familiar with some of the issues, although they were experiencing the same things. They have created what I consider to be, some of you may have seen it actually, uh, an excellent information gathering uh, system in conjunction with ITS. They've been having conversations with ITS. So those concerns will be heard. Those people, the both that uh, very kindly gave uh, me comments on the document I sent out, that's all going to be folded into. Uh, that uh, that survey. So, uh, you also mentioned, and this is up to uh, uh, Dr. Preston or Dr. Kelly, but um, uh, Hugh Russell said that he would 
Uh, B, if it was okay with other people to be willing to come and have a chat and set it in April. The other thing... Yes, okay. Nobody did do it all. <laughs> um, the office space uh, in December, um, we spoke to uh, Dr. Preston about the office space use innovation yeah. thing. And um, uh, I want to thank yet again IFE. Mandy and Brian helped me put that together. And also um, Becky DeMayer. I spoke to Dr. Preston. Uh, he was okay with that. And I want to thank Dr. Emma as well for getting that. We're getting that out the door. And I'm Dr. McLean and Dr. Zanny for the uh, surveys and creation. So I don't know when that's going to close. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to ask Dr. Preston. I don't know if any of you have got any ideas about when that survey should close. One more thing, the last thing is a task force that Laura and I are on. We're going through the discrepancy between the faculty and student handbooks. However, I was thinking on academic honesty, I was thinking that maybe we should wait until we have an AI idea or policy or framework before we start to mess with that. Laurie and Laurie, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a work group, it's just the two of us. But um, especially one who added a uh, uh, policy. Now, I do want to... Not a policy, a set of guidelines. Guidelines, sorry. <laughs> well, I put actually policy in inverted commas. I should have put it in italic. But I do understand, and uh, there's somebody else working on it too, so I may contact them. I can't remember the lady's name. It's Anne Marie somebody. Reed. Anne Marie Reed. So I, I think I'm going to, Laura, if you and I talk to her and make sure we're not duplicating everything and wait till we've got the AI through, then I don't want to do it and then have the read embed the wheel. I'm going to have a shout out. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much. Thank you for your semi speed round. <laughs> uh, no permanent updates from TLA, but from the workload task force, uh, we've been on work for researching. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, I'm uh, The Senate Workload uh, Task Force has done their research on workload imaging for the faculty. Guiding questions and topics have been framed by the task force in relation to questions and issues related to workload. Um, this has provided a foundation for research into existing policies and guidance outlined at other institutions in accreditation standards and the AADP. Research is ongoing and will be used in helping to develop any data collection methods used on campus to help us better understand workload at UWG as we work towards introductory patients. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, I'll briefly share that the survey is continuing as we asked for as a body uh, regarding the course schedule is live as of this past Wednesday. So we already have uh, last I looked this morning, we have almost 700 students responses that oh. are to that. So wow. we're going to get some very valuable information. And plenty of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the IP task force has looked at peer and aspirant schools and the other adoption of the test to outside of the public political exercise. Wonderful. Look at that. Great work. My goodness. Thank you, everybody. Uh, anything else? Okay, I'm going to turn the time over to Kim Green for undergraduate programs. UPC uh, just has 14 action items that were in your agenda. We didn't receive any questions by um, email, but we might have questions at any of those items. Just 14. <laughs> That's small for UPC. <laughs> we, 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 we're not. Um, any no questions? Okay, so then we're ready for vote. All in favor of those 14 items, please raise your hand. Okay, any opposed or any abstentions? And there were two information items and then we plan to teach. Graduate programs. GPC had 21 proposals that were put up for consideration and approved by the committee. We did not, as well as two other making items, we did not have any questions that were sent in previously. Are there any questions now? Then, with your approval, if you are in favor of approving those 21 proposals, please raise your hand. If you disapprove, Abstain. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, Faculty Development Committee, I believe, Ru, you're going to speak. I'm substituting for Dr. Como. Uh, there is a single item, which is a proposal to amend the faculty handbook so that senior lecturers can take part as members on promotion committees for lecturers to senior lecturers. Are there any questions? Uh, Madam Secretary, is there any online voting? No, we're not. No. Well, first. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hands. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rules committee? Okay. Uh, uh, our committee voted in the past three uh, action items. The first one is about uh, uh, the proposal for modifying faculty senate handbook. We basically establish the the uh, official procedure of how to modify the faculty senate handbook. We basically work with the Office of Legal Affairs. They basically help uh, uh, write the proposal. So it's passed the, uh, at our committee meeting. So should we? Okay, so if all are uh, all in favor, say I or raise hand. Please raise hands. Yeah, please raise your hand. Yeah. If you're a senator. Okay. Great. And it is approved. Uh, abstain. And our second item is uh, also from uh, Office of Legal Affairs about the, the commission on the list of. Uh, updated duplicated policy and procedure in the body staff. So basically these uh, policy procedure are outdated or some just duplicated. And we already checked all the links uh, in the attachment. So uh, I think we're ready to vote for that too. If, uh, uh, if all our favor say aye, or please raise your hands. Anybody opposed? Stay. And the last one is a proposal to change bylaws regarding the executive secretary. Basically, uh, the main change is, uh, uh, I think, the uh, for the secretary's uh, workload uh, from uh, modified from uh, per year to per semester. So. Uh, we're ready for vote also, and if you want our favor, say aye or please raise your hands. Oh. Opposed? I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, um, so with our time left, which has gotten a little tight, we're going to take some time to break into small groups for listening sessions to meet with members of the Arts, Humanities, Social Sciences Steering Group. This is one area where our collaboration with administration has been very good. We've been involved in all of the new college institute, now another college discussions. And so this is gonna be a chance for us to give input as a Senate, which represents again, everyone across campus. So when you meet and sit down, our, our, our members, let's have you raise your, or can you guys raise your hand or stand up? Members of the arts committee. Okay, so you're going to kind of separate out and meet with small groups and then uh, gather ideas. At this point, we're, we're interested in what we call phase one, which is gathering the kind of big ideas about what arts, humanities, and social sciences could do at University of West Georgia to meet the needs of our world, the trends that are going on now, but will also be present five years from now, 10 years from now. How do we position those fields of study in a way? that they and their students can be successful going forward in meeting the world's needs. So go ahead and, and break into small groups if you would. And we're gonna need you know, about half an hour of time to do this. So don't hold back on your ideas. Share them quickly and powerfully. Thank you so much. And if both will kind of move around, 
from the steering group. Uh, I <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So that kind of so I told the mayor and press the I need to be on Yeah. 
So we got to talk. So we got to talk about the other thing. I'm ready. I'm ready. Me too. I don't have any problem. I'm Literally, I'm going to see you guys. Literally, I'm going to see you guys. Literally, I'm going to see you guys. Yeah, the major thing is they need to just say you are on the other one. Yeah, literally, I'm going to see you guys. January, they need to call us. We're talking about the major network set up. We're talking about doing something. We're talking about doing something. We're talking about doing I have currently basically now run this weird connection with like five motions that they have to get from strike system and data down to the top of the page. No, we can do that. Yeah, I think it's just the sort of thing I'm going on. I should also show you something we'll figure out. They're not straight enough. Yeah, well, in the first conversation, first call, you're going to have to pay for the other I'm not going to tell you. 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 I'm
So, um, sorry. Normally, uh, normally we would kind of gather together and talk in the whole, but I'm aware that spring break is essentially starting for many of you. I also know that we've got the steering group, they've got notes from the meetings that you've had in small groups. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to wrap up our, our Senate meeting. Unless someone has something they are dying to say from their small group discussions. Okay, then I thank you all so much for your participation today. We went a little over time. Sorry about that, but I do hope your brain can be productive, breathful, whatever you need it to be. I hope you get it. <laughs> and then uh, we'll see you back in April. And in April, we'll want to have uh, reports from our task forces and committees and kind of wrap up the year uh, that way. And then, of course, we have our general faculty meeting, which will be, I think it's April 26th or so. You'll get more information about that. So thank you, everybody. And we're adjourned. Have a great break. Thank Oh, that's always on there. They just need to keep on coming. Keep on coming. It's just 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 it